Welcome back. This morning we're going to be continuing with our exploration of the four levels of awareness. Um, in particular, Sangharachita's exposition of those four levels of awareness. So he gave a, if you like, a, um, a more modern, more up-to-date slant on really on Satipatthana practice is what we're looking at here. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, we've we've looked at the first two of those. So with the Tuliamati, we started off with awareness of things. Um, and last week, Stiranaga took you through awareness of self. So this week we have awareness of people, the third in that stage. Um, so I'd like to start off by quoting from Bante. And um, this is a quote from um, the Noble Eightfold Path, or Vision and Transformation, as that book was initially called. And um, Bante speaks about uh, communication there. And he says that uh, we can say that love means awareness of the being of another person. We can say that love means awareness of the being of another person. So in a sense, I could just leave this morning's talk there, really. I mean, what more is there to say? Um, it's quite fortunate we were doing Meta Bardna this morning. I don't think anyone arranged it. Maybe they did and didn't tell me. Arranged for us to be doing Meta Bardna on this particular morning. But um, of course, you know, in the meta practice, we are trying to um, to become more aware of other beings and to hold them with love. And um, I think the necessity for both comes out very clearly when we're doing the meta bhavana practice. That really, it's it's not possible to have a true sense of meta of loving kindness towards another being if we're not aware of them. Um, and conversely, if we do experience love for another being, love in the sense of metta I'm talking about here, um, then that is, it's it's there in the presence of awareness. Um, you know, I know from my own experience of the metta practice on occasions when I'm I'm not particularly aware when I, I bring someone to mind and it's it's just a label, it's just a name, it's it's a good friend, or it's a difficult person, but it's just a name and a label and there's no real awareness of the person then there's no real meta going on either the meta itself seems just to be um, almost going through the motions as it were and yet when i have a strong sense of the person the meta flows so much more easily um, i remember discussing this many years ago with um with, with my preceptor and uh, uh and talking about it and he said well you, know, you need to be interested in the person in meta practice if you're really going to experience meta for them you have to you know find a way of developing an interest in that person which is i guess another way of saying of being aware of that person um and and when we have an interest then it's so much easier to feel that love for another person so we may think that we're aware of people all the time. You, know, you may reply to that. Well, of course, I'm aware of other people. You know, I know there are other people around me. I'm, I'm aware of people all the time. But actually, we're probably not, if we were really honest with ourselves. You know, we're probably not really that aware of other people as individual beings in, in all that that entails, with all that that means to be a, a, another human being. We're certainly aware of bodies around us. We're aware of people getting in our way. We're aware of people not doing the things that we want them to do when we want them to do them or in the way that we want them to do them. But that's that's not really quite the same thing, is it? That's, um, that's more an awareness of our negative reaction to people. And generally speaking, we could say that you know we 
we see people in terms of our emotional reactions to them rather than seeing the people themselves. Um, and that, that reaction is largely dependent, of course, on our past conditioning and on our habitual patterns. Um, I'm reminded um, not so long ago, just uh, maybe a couple of years ago, this was, um, there was a chap in the Sangha um, and he came up to me after he'd been coming for about six months or so. And he spoke to me after a class and um, uh, I think I just offered to give him a lift home if he wanted one. And uh, he said to me, he said, oh, I, you know, I'm really sorry that I've not been very friendly towards you. He said, but um, he says, you look exactly like a school teacher I had who was really horrible to me. And every time I look at you, I just get all these memories coming back of how horrible this school teacher was to me and how, how much he upset me and hurt me. And he said, and I'm finding it really difficult to relate to you because of that. Um, so th there's an, uh, an example of uh, you know, how, how we respond to people based on our habitual patterns and on our conditioning. Uh, we see someone, they remind us of a, an unfortunate experience that we had in the past and we find ourselves associating them with that experience, even though they had nothing to do with it. And we respond to them on that basis. We respond to them on those senses of pleasure or displeasure or neutrality that we feel um, based on that conditioning. So if, if the past condition is pleasant, if someone reminds us of um, a happy time in our life, then we can be quite open with them perhaps. Um, if they remind us of an unhappy time, then we may feel dislike for them, even though they had nothing to do with, with that. Or they may evoke no particular emotional response in us at all, and we tend to just ignore them. Because um, there's no reason to connect with them as far as we can see. So when we see someone, we almost immediately, we attach a label. Um, we can't help doing it. It's, it's part of the way, you know, part of the way the uh, perceptual process works. Uh, we see someone and we put a label on them. Um, and that label will, as I say, be based on our past experience. Um, but the problem is that we then relate to the label and not to the person. Um, and we relate to um, you know, this, this sort of generic character or this pigeonhole, if you like, this box that we put this person into simply because of some past association that reminds us of, uh, of something uh, that we don't like or that we do like. So all the time we're doing this, we're, we're, we're pigeonholing people, we're making assumptions about people, uh, we're labeling people, and then we're reacting to those uh, those labels that we project onto them. And all that gets in the way of actually seeing the person in front of us, stops us from really engaging with another human being. So I'm gonna show some images and we'll have a look through some images. And when these images come up, if possible, just try to stay with your immediate response. So try not to get caught up in thinking about the image or analyzing it, or but just, just notice if you can, what's your immediate response to the image and just stay with that for a while. So um, yeah, we'll have the first couple of images now. Thanks, Stiranaga. Okay, so unfortunately, I think we probably all react to people some of the time, if not a lot of the time, I know I certainly do, as if they were shop window dummies or if they were just robots. You know, we, we, we see people in terms of their utilitarian value to us. What's this person going to do for me? What can I get out of this relationship? What's in it for me? 
uh, may not put it quite such harsh terms as that when we're talking to ourselves. We may not even think that at all, but that very often can be our immediate response. Um, is there something in this for me? If not, then basically the person's just a, a mannequin with clothes on, or maybe even worse, just a, just a machine, just something there to provide us with uh, some sort of service. We don't really see people as people at all. And a lot of the time they're just, as I say, just objects in our environment and we relate to them uh, on that way. So if we can see no benefit to us, then our tendency is simply not to engage. So we'll have a look at a few more slides now. There's an interesting response there. So when that picture of the guy holding the cup came up, I, I instinctively started reaching for my cup of tea that was just in front of me. That's a, an odd connection there. So yeah, it's um, you know we we put people into categories. If we do engage with them, it tends to be on the basis of um, stereotyping, putting people in to categories based on our prejudices, not always conscious prejudices, very often they're subconscious prejudices that we've, we've acquired, that we've built up um, over time from our society, from our family, from our peer groups, from the media. Uh, we have this whole framework of um, ideas, concepts of, of, of uh, the way things work and, and of other people and of um, and we, we, we do this all the time, don't we? Pigeonholing people, um, not really seeing them as individuals, but just putting them into a box and assuming that we know uh, what they're all about simply because of some external uh, facet of their, their being there, just their appearance, for example. Um, so we'll look at a couple of more slides now. The next two, I think, um, you know, probably. Uh, would do this for us, you know, just just see how, how you may be pigeonholing um, the people you depicted in these next two slides. And of course, we're, we're so used to doing this. We're so used to just labeling people and responding to those labels um, that we don't realize that we're not really seeing another person at all. We don't realize that we're just seeing our projections. We're just seeing the labels that we put on to people. And uh, this doesn't just happen with people that we don't know or only know a little. So all of those images we've just looked at would have been complete unknown I'm guessing to all of us they certainly were unknown to me um, images just picked up off the internet um, but even so completely random and totally unknown um, images can produce a response um, and that response can be much much stronger of course with people that we do know 
uh, with people closest to us. Um, again, Bante suggests that, um, that this happens perhaps more in our more intimate relationships even than it does with, um, with, with people that we don't know that well. Um, that with those nearest to us and dearest to us, all too often we find ourselves communicating not with the person but with our projection onto that person. That we have this, this notion, this idea, this, this conceptual framework of, of a wife or a husband or a son or a daughter, mother, father. Uh, they're all labels and without realizing it, we project uh, these labels and everything that comes with the label onto the person themselves. And then we relate to that label we relate to all of those projections that we've made. And then when the other person doesn't respond in accordance with the label or with how we think that you know, a person in that category fulfilling that function should respond, then we react and the relationship suffers. Uh, and it suffers not necessarily because of uh, who that person is or, or how that person is, but it suffers because we have an expectation based on our own internal ideas about how that person should be um, because of the role they fulfill. And we project that onto them and expect them to behave in that way. You know, it's uh, probably the downfall, isn't it, of most uh, well, when a romantic relationship goes wrong, it's uh, usually one partner says to the other, well, you've changed. You're not the same person that you were when I first knew you. Actually, probably what's more likely to happen is that um, the projections begun to break down and you started to see, to some extent, the person as they truly are, and you're no longer looking at the projection onto them that you made, and you realize that actually, I don't like that person. I preferred the projection that I put on them in the first place. And so, yeah, it's maybe a rather simplistic way of looking at it, but that's the kind of mechanism that's at work there. And um, Bante goes on to make um, a very strong assertion that we can go through our entire lives without ever really communicating with another person, but only communicating with our projections onto them. And of course, that's a two way thing um, because they're communicating with their projections onto us. And so people can spend an entire lifetime together and never, ever really, really know each other unless they put their minds to, uh, to it, of course. Um, so I thought long and hard about an example for this and I could only come up with one. So um, I'm hoping she'll forgive me. So if we could have the final slide, please, dear Naga. So some of you may know who this is, some of you won't, but this is a person um, on whom I could very easily and sometimes do project certain stereotypical images. This is, that was, that was Mary to whom I'm married. Um, so I'm deliberately not using the term my wife because of course wife is another label and a very strong label as is husband. And um, those occasions when things don't necessarily go as smoothly between us as they could, um, I can generally trace back to um, being down to the fact that one or both of us is relating to a projection and not to the real person. That I'm seeing Mary as this thing called wife, which comes with a whole host of expectations. And um, Mary is just being Mary. And um, yeah, and, and if I'm not aware enough of that, then of course um, there's the potential there for, uh, for disagreement, shall we say. Um, and this can happen in all of our close relationships. Yeah, it's, it's so easy just to attach these labels to, to someone. I mean, even to the extent of saying that, you know, that, that Mary is the woman that I married, um, again, carries a whole host of assumptions and labels. Um, a whole host of ideas, expectations uh, on my part, 
most of them subconscious and uh, certainly not aware of them but that's our job isn't it to try and to try and make ourselves more aware to try and bring these um these these ideas these prejudices if you like out into the open so that we can see how they're affecting the way we relate to other people um because we have to do if, if unless we want to live our lives in this state of um really non-communication simply communicating with our own ideas about people then we need to do something about it we need to become more aware of people as they really are um, and Bante says that this all starts with really looking at the other person, really seeing them. So when we're talking to someone else, you know, do we actually look at them or do we kind of look slightly off to one side or you know, looking over their shoulder or we're looking down, down at our feet or their feet um, because we feel uncomfortable perhaps in really looking at someone. Uh, really engaging with them directly with a sense of openness and receptivity because of course if we really want to see the other person then we have to be prepared to allow them to really see us and that's that's where the fear comes in yeah it's uh, it might be easy to see someone else but how easy is it to let someone else see us how prepared are we to let someone really into who we are, to drop the barriers, to take off the mask and to expose ourselves to another being. Um, so that's the fear that we have to deal with. That's the, the obstacle that we have to overcome, which in a way ties back in, of course, to um, last week, this uh, awareness of self. So if we truly want to become aware of other people, we first need to become more aware of ourselves. So we're going to do a little exercise. It's long been a tradition in Sri Ratna to do communication exercises. And um, I think this is probably a first. Um, we're going to do a communication exercise via Zoom. So now you're about to understand why you were paired up with other people at the beginning of this morning. I'm going to try and explain how this works and I can only explain it in terms of what works on my laptop and I hope something similar works on yours. Um, so if you go to the little picture of the person you were paired with, which you'll probably find across the top of your screen if your screen's like mine, and if you take your cursor up in, okay, so you might like to unpin your partner now. Which uh, on my device is uh, on the top left hand corner of their image, but maybe elsewhere on yours. Okay, so. Um, that's just the first of a series of communication exercises. We may go through the others at some stage. Um, we'll see. So we're going to break back uh, into our groups now. Um, just one question really for, for the group, and that's, that's to talk about our experience of that communication exercise. You may want to bring in some of the other stuff that I talked about, but let's focus mainly on, on yeah, uh, how that felt for us, that communication exercise. Um, did it work? Did we feel a connection? Did we feel um, exposed? Did, did we find it embarrassing or difficult? Be interesting to find out. Okay, let's go off to our groups. <laughs> 